No worries. Well done, Chris. The Trojan effort. Okay, so uh, now we can properly get kicked off, I think. Uh, okay. Why don't you, uh, so just to summarize what this event about is about, the idea is, is that we wanted to have the opportunity to uh, bring together some experts from the community and uh, sit them down so they have a chance to chat and share knowledge about what they've been working on. Uh, because at the moment, there's a lot of people that are sat at home and possibly have less things to do uh, and want to maybe use this opportunity as a chance to to learn about what the uh, new opportunities are and sort of find new ideas for them to explore. So we thought if we do a series of Q&As, uh, sorry, uh, ask me anything, on different topics uh, from different residents and maybe further afield as well, it would be a really nice way for everyone to sit down and uh, share some knowledge together. So... Today, Michael, you are our special guest. Uh, thank you for being our test dummy. We've already had some technical issues, but I think we'll get past them now. Uh, You're doing great. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so I wanted to uh, to first really ask you about yourself and your background uh, and what sort of experiences uh, you had before you got into working with 360. Okay. Um, well, it's a long story, Chris, because <laughs> I started when I was 17. And uh, I'd always loved telly and sound in particular. And I went along to Anglia Television. I lived in Norwich and there's a TV station there, Anglia Television. Um, went there and, and got a job as a general trainee. I worked all over the TV station from there's a film laboratory downstairs right the way through to, I don't know where, studios and on location and stuff. And the people who had the best parties were the editors. So I decided to go into the cutting rooms and I left after five years, I left Anglia as a, an assistant film editor with a union ticket in my hand. And, um, and I set off into the, the, the world of freelancing. Yeah. And then I worked on a variety of TV shows and movies and um, traveled a lot with my work because I transferred, I moved from, assistant editing to sound editing, feature films, back into factual programming and documentaries, which is where my heart is. I, mm -hmm. I, I like factual programming, always have done. And uh, that, that took me all over the place. I had a wonderful time. Um, where are some I, of the most interesting places you visited while you're there? You shouldn't ask me that question. Oh God, this is going to be a long one. <laughs> yeah. I've only got an hour. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'd I've, 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 I've like to think I've been in pretty much every Tintin book that there is. <laughs> so if the Tintin had an adventure, I've probably done that. And then there are a few on the side as well. So it's been a very exciting life so far. I've had a wonderful time, met some amazing people, been to some extraordinary places and done some fantastic things and had opportunities that you could never dream of. So, yeah, that's that's nice. But it's got nothing to do with 360 production. Um, we, can, we, can, we can move on to that. We can move on to that. Um, yeah, let's, let's it was, just, it was just nice to hear the background because I think a lot, at the moment as well, a lot of people um, are assessing their skills and assessing what they're interested in. Yeah. Uh, and so it's also nice to hear the backgrounds that people come from because uh, right. a lot of the case with some of the uh, technologies that we deal with at the Fuse Box, uh, the residents are they're very they're, they're new skills that you need. Uh, right. And a lot of them are fairly new industries. So okay. I think uh, there's there can be some surprises. I think. So the 360 coming from a filmmaking background sort of probably makes the most sense yeah. at the moment. Well, of course, there are a lot of very transferable skills. Um, if I was thinking about the why and how I did what I did, it's probably as interesting as anything. All I ever did was focus on what I really, really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. My parents asked me a very important question. When I was failing all my exams at school, they asked me one simple question that changed my life, and that was, what do you want to do? Where do you want to be? Where do you want to, what do you want to do? Where do you want to, what do you want to be? And, uh, and I just thought on that and, and I kind of followed that and I've, I've, I've looked out to see who's doing cool stuff and what I think, what, what I find, what do I enjoy? What do I like? And I've gone out to find those people who are doing the things that I like, doing the stuff that I think is cool. I've tracked them down and found a way of getting to work with them. And I've always done that. And as a freelancer in particular, that's a really good um, way to, make sure that you're going to be happy in what you do and it, it and, and and also have some success because you know if you're happy doing what you're doing you're going to be successful at it um and the postman's knocking at the door hopefully someone else will get it <laughs> um so 
yeah so find people doing cool stuff track them down make yourself attractive to them uh, people love to talk about themselves i'm really enjoying this you know I like to talk <laughs> and you'll find that if you know something about somebody without stalking them you can find an awful lot of stuff out about people there were a few people who were making films who i really admired people like nick rogue peter greenaway alex cox uh david hayman a few others mm -hmm. and i really wanted to work with them so i tracked down the people who were working with them um, and I said, I want to work with this, these people because of this, that, and the other. And they responded to that. They understood that because they were in there for this, exactly the same reason. So if you can find people who are doing stuff that you enjoy, explain to them what it is you enjoy about it. Prove to them in some way that you enjoy it because maybe you, you dabble. You know, I, so coming back to 360, it started for me as a, an interest, as a real curiosity. I was thinking... What can what what can we do with this? What can we do with this? It was way back in the late nineties. Um, came across a camera called a Ladybug, which was a surveillance camera, and um, there was a network MSN, and they they they'd taken this Ladybug camera around a, a place that had been destroyed by a hurricane, and you're mm -hmm. on the internet, then you could you could pan around. And you can have a look around to see the devastation and watch these two people talking. And I thought, this is amazing. This is really, this is the future. But there's so much more to be done. There's so much more to be done. And it's still true today. There's so much that you can do, different things. And um, that in itself is a bit of a worry and a bit of a danger. Because important thing is focus. Mm -hmm. Focus, focus. It's really important. So, um, yeah, so that was the I was actually going to ask you how you got into 360, but um, and so I think that would probably be a good lead on from there. But before yeah, before so we get there, I thought I'd quickly uh, add actually what uh, got me got me interested and what actually taught me about stitching in the first place. I don't because I don't think I've ever mentioned this to you. Was uh, you know the because it was actually I for a long time I had a block between the panora panorama photography and 360 because obviously you have this sort of 180 oh. video that uh, photos and video that falls in between as well. But we used to do this really fantastic thing where you would uh, you'd take a panorama photograph of your friend vertically, but as you oh, yeah. move, they move in the opposite direction. So you get these really oh. distorted images of where the background is normal, but the, the faces and bodies have started to become distorted. I learned so much about stitching from that, <laughs> from, from having to try and mess around with these silly photographs with friends, uh, so you, that you it became play. so useful <laughs> like years later. What um, a great way to learn through play. That's, the, that's mm. absolutely draw that's a real lesson right there <laughs> play yeah, yeah exactly uh, and, and i feel like this is actually how you got into it as well in a way it was not that the play side is uh so, no you, hobby you went out and bought your camera i presume and what did you exactly. get first and what were you why, why first camera was a rico theta a little one it was a couple hundred pounds and it was like a dream come true because suddenly i could capture things in 360 and start playing with them and see what they look like. And th there were, there's obviously this, there's, there are communities out there playing with this stuff. And it was very quick that rules, it became apparent there were some rules that shouldn't be broken. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, what do you do with rules is you get to understand them and then you break them, yeah. which is what you were doing with your camera. You know, you know what, how this should work, but I know, well, let's, let's break the rules. Let's do something a bit different mm -hmm. and experiment. And um, pushing the boundaries, knowing the rules, but respecting the laws of physics and mathematics <laughs> is important because there are some things you really can't do, some things you really can't do. Mm. But trying, trying is going to, to throw up some interesting results. And I, I, I think at the moment it's still a time for experimentation. We're, we're yeah. still very early days with the technology. Yeah. Uh, I think if you look at the, film, the films which are doing well, they're, yeah. they're still fundamentally very simple and i think they haven't a lot of them haven't had a chance to fully explore uh, or come up with a medium i mean uh film itself was always it took such a long time to come along uh and the the art style that came with it took so long we've had some really good talks uh, by speakers who've explained different storytelling techniques and uh different approaches that i think 360 enables because you have this presence you are there and be being present in something is so is so important and that lets you t 
tell so many different stories by how you leverage that? Yes. Being, it is all about being there, mm. uh, when you're capturing stuff and taking people to places where they thought they'd never go, places that don't even exist. Of course, fantasy world is a, is a massive one, but I'm, I'm much more into the real world. Mm-hmm. Um, I, the biggest question, the first question, most important question with everything is who's watching? I mean, I don't know who's watching this now. I don't even know really particularly why they're watching. <laughs> Apart from this little brief that it gave us. Um, but why people? Why 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 do it in three hundred and sixty? That, that's what you have got to ask. You know why why isn't this just a piece of radio or an article in a magazine or just a web page? Why in three hundred and sixty? Why video? Um, you know, and then make the most of that. To understand, it's classic, isn't it? Why why are you doing this? Mm-hmm. And um, who's watching? And why are they watching? Those are the the big questions, and those are the things to focus on all the time and uh, to satisfy them. Now, you're going to ask me another question, I hope. Uh, yes, I am. So, yeah, to go back to your origin story, which yeah. I think we're, we're going through the Michael Dank's origin story at the minute. Um, what? Because I've, I've been working with you for the past sort of couple of years, so I've seen some of the more recent things, but what was your first um, professional project that you worked on? In 360? Yeah, yeah. When, when, you, when did you decide to go from being a hobbyist to actually working with it (laughs) well that's a really interesting question because the the slide between hobby and professional is a really is a really interesting one Mm -hmm. there are ways of doing it some people do it with um a little bit of building themselves up and building themselves up and putting themselves out there what i did i worked for people i went and did professional in inverted commas professional jobs but didn't want to get paid for it it's a bit naughty to do that Mm-hmm. But what it does, it gives you a bit of a show reel, and it shows, it proves your skills, gives you confidence. So I would go out, I would find people. Who did I get? Who's the first one? I can't remember. Oh, I did. I so I, so I, where I saw so the first job I ever did, which wasn't a paid job, and it wasn't a professional job. First job I ever did, I saw an opportunity for a three hundred and sixty no brainer which was at the top of the hill up here, there are two windmills and Jack and Jill and Jack windmill was having a new cap put on. Mm -hmm. So here you have a round building, which is having the cap put on the top. And I said to the guys doing it, I said, look, I really want to put a camera in the middle of the top of the mill when the cap comes on, because it will be awesome to be, that would be an awesome place to be. It's going to be a place where you never think you could ever get to be. And it's not every day a windmill has its cap taken off. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> and uh, that isn't why I've got that here, obviously. Um, so I went and did that. And the pitch quality on the theatre was dreadful. It was 2K resolution, um, which is less than, well, less than half the minimum currently. Right. <laughs> but, but, the, but the result, I was really pleased with the results. And if there was a problem with that, I'd show it to people and say, look at this, it's great. And they'd go... Yeah, it's great, but the pitch quality is dreadful if they were a bit technical. Or they if they weren't technical, they'd say, Yeah, but why would I be interested in that? They just didn't get it. Which was awkward. I think you found a really fortunate position sounding from the hobby, uh, where you really sort of were doing it because you're enjoying it. And I do think that there is a risk of people being exploited when they start offering work for free. Um Absolutely. however, in your situation, it's it's something that I think you would have done for your own interest anyway. Uh, and yeah. it's just kind of getting permission to do it. And then fortunately, in some cases, and then finding that, oh, I can get paid for this as well. Well, there's, there's one rule. There's one rule, one mm-hmm. very, very important rule. There's only one rule. And that is if you're doing something for free for somebody and they're making money out of your effort, they should pay you. Yeah. However, if you're doing something for free, and they are, they've never broken this rule, if you're doing something for free, make sure that they're not going to profit from it. That's fair this enough. You can you can create things of great value without making without creating the opportunity for profit. You know, there's there's also there's also the mutual benefits of doing things. Um, so I, when I worked with Plumpton College, lovely bunch of people, big shout for Plumpton College. Mm-hmm. They were um, they wanted to create some three hundred and sixty content, and I was all I was just so excited. I found them through the Wired Sussex website. Well, we found each other through the Wired Sussex website. Excellent. Big up the Wired Sussex website. If you're looking for a job, there's lots of opportunities there. And if you've got opportunities to offer people, 
it's a great place to go. I, you didn't add, I definitely didn't pay you for that. <laughs> definitely. That's a free one. And but this is the, the, the idea was that they didn't have much of a budget. They weren't going to profit from it. So I said, well, that's okay. I said, look, my daily rate is this, but I'll do it for a lot less than that, you know, just to cover my expenses and a, and a bit more. And they said, fantastic. And we, because it was just an experiment. And we did it and it worked. And then we did more. And they weren't profiting from this. They were just using it to show students um, the potential of virtual reality headsets and, and testing it out and writing a paper, a bit of academic work, if you like. And um, that was successful. And then we... Then I went on to work with them on a project with British Airways, and uh, that was good. And obviously, then you could start getting paid a proper rate. Yeah. So that's that's kind of how it works. If people are going to profit from it, then you should share in that profit. But as I say, there's ways of creating value without profit, and those are the little opportunities that you can make yourself. Very nice. And so over over that time, you've you've sort of, I think gained a lot of experience as a document i think a 360 documentarian is actually probably is probably a very good term for that um, nice. yeah i i and actually i do think incidentally that uh documentary film filmmaking is one of the things that um i think this medium really lends itself to i'm oh, sure. i can't wait for planet earth 360 I, they've done little d dabbles in it the bbc and things yeah. but i want a full attenborough documented yeah oh that would be that would be quite well, something, particularly at the B, moment. Yeah, well, the Beeb have moved all of their virtual reality over to the commercial arm now, so it's only BBC Studios who are doing VR. Yeah. So watch that space, Chris. I'm sure you won't be there'll, disappointed. There'll be something. There, has to be. there will be a lot of things. Um, and over the, over the time, uh, you said that if I asked you to sort of go through your favourite places you visited before 360, we could be here a while. Uh, yeah. But out of the things that you've shot and filmed, what's been the most interesting to you? particularly of the sort of the more recent work as well. If there's something that you would, another case where you kind of got paid, but you would, you would, you would, you would do that just for the pure interest of it. <laughs> there, might, there must be a few out there. <laughs> well, I don't know. Um, this is fairly, a lot of the work has been fairly prosaic, but with Make Real, a lovely VR agency in Brighton who I've been working with. And they are here listening. I can see them in chat. <laughs> I'll better be careful what I say. They've offered me some amazing opportunities and, um so working shooting the inside of a bank doesn't sound very stimulating but actually working with the people helping them understand why we were doing it this way and how it might work was really fun and everyone was really engaged with it it's a bit like being a missionary going out into the wilderness to un meeting unreached people and um you know getting to experience some new thing which is which is really cool mm. um same with also I've been working with VR Craftworks, another marvelous agency. I don't know if any of them are watching, but VR Craftworks uh, are work, still working on a project for them um, with a charity in Wales called Safe Foundation mm -hmm. on a project about unconscious bias. And in shooting that, I've met some people who it's been a great privilege to meet. Uh, and uh, it's about the people often more than the places. That, that these opportunities bring i would say and you can meet people around the corner but you have to keep six feet away from them right yeah so that is the perfect time for the the one token question that i feel like i have to mention which is the uh, elephant in the room uh yeah. at the moment a lot of i know a lot of people that are working in events and event production i mean here we are doing this virtually uh a yeah. lot of a lot of events have been cancelled and a lot of sort of the opportunities for a lot of people have sort of dried up being stuck at home uh yeah. what what do you think this means for do you think this this is going to be like a new opportunity for people to start going around and documenting things preserving things so that if this you know being isolated from the world for so long made us made people realize we're lacking in a lot of content that could help us escape these moments gosh <laughs> that that's was a, a very leading that. question i apologize i've had an <laughs> idea in my mind there's a lot to unpack in that question um how are things going to change? I don't think nothing nothing changes terribly fast unless you get some kind of figure who's someone who's going to really change the world. Someone who's someone who's going to, who's everyone's going to start taking notice of. Mm -hmm. I don't see anybody out there in this world at the moment in the VR three hundred and sixty world who everyone's gone. 
look at this. This is amazing. What this person's done is extraordinary. I'm a big fan of fan of Ben Claremont. Thanks, thanks, Bell. He's a YouTuber. Um, he's done some cool stuff. He's he's very he's really good, and he's he shares all of his knowledge, and and he's he's great. I recommend Ben Claremont. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, uh, no panic. <laughs> uh, where were we? How things going to change? Yeah. So it's no no one person I've seen is going to change everything for anybody. <clears throat> I think at the moment we're all preaching to the converted. You know what, what we're doing is everybody who knows about three hundred and sixty is interested in three hundred and sixty, and it's a very broad church. I'm using that word mm -hmm. again. Um, there are people doing amazing stuff in factual programming. There are people doing fantastic stuff in the commercial and um, industry side of things. And uh, there are people doing great stuff for fun. Um, so there isn't one thing that's ever going to bring it together. It's a very broad church. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I'm just quite optimistic that this might... I, I know that at the moment, a lot of the VR headsets are completely sold out everywhere. I think that's partly because of supply shortages as well as the demand, uh, the demand increase. But I, I, I think that you know we're heading towards a time where there's going to be a lot more uh, isolation to come over the next yeah. over the next however long we're here for. And I think yeah. that the chance of escapism that VR in general provides, and I think 360 more than more than some of the software stuff. I think there's some really cool opportunities. I, I've been watching more 360 content recently than I think I ever have, just because you know it gives you that sort of ch chance to see something different, go out, take a break, and not see the same four walls around you the whole time. So the people who are going to drive that are the manufacturers, mm -hmm. uh, and so there are people like Sony Entertainment. I would hope who are both manufacturing and content creators. You know, they're really vertically integrated in that way. They would. Um, they could do something interesting and amazing yeah and then oculus and facebook it's a no-brainer why shouldn't why shouldn't that really take off you know um of course as you say far eastern supply chains are a bit of an issue at the moment um yeah there needs to be there needs to be a big push and i and i don't know much there are plenty of other people you can talk to who would know much more about that um i did see you know people doing 8k uh, broadcasts of uh, conferences in over 5G. Mm. That's amazing. Who's watching? What are they watching on? And how many of them are there? Yeah, I really don't know. I I, um, I, I feel like a lot of and what I've my experiences recently with doing virtual events is that in general the UK uh, broadband infrastructure isn't quite as strong as it is for the as it needs to be at the moment. Uh, there's basically, I've seen a lot of software and products that are very popular in America because uh, there's a lot of people there who have very, very fast internet. And then yeah. over here, I've seen the reviews for those same products not doing quite as well because we're just not, there's still connection issues every now and then. I, I still flick into 360p as, you know, the, it's not perfect yet, but yeah. I, I've had quite a lot of disconnects and things. I had a speaker who couldn't make it to our last virtual event as well um, mm. because of internet problems. So. I think yeah. there's there's people saying that people fitting broadband aren't essential workers, but they 100% are at the moment. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of barriers. Yeah, uh, but but it doesn't mean there's less fun to have, and there are also plenty of opportunities for work, for paid work, um, out there, mm -hmm. and uh, awesome things to learn. Uh, go out, practice, have a go, and do something. Yeah. Um, so. To change the tone and get us get us away from that, I'm, I thought we'd ask some technical questions this time. Technical as in as in equipment, because uh, I think there's there's a lot of there's a lot of cameras out there at the minute, uh, and if someone is looking at getting involved at the moment, how do they find the right camera for them, uh, and what what sort of what companies are leading the leading the charge at the minute? Uh, Insta are leading the charge. Mm -hmm. Uh, GoPro, of course, is a wonderful thing. Um, the thing is, a different camera, a different job. Rico, the Theta, the new Theta camera is awesome, but it's only awesome for stills. It's shonky on video. Uh, the mm. GoPro is a fabulous piece of kit, but if it 
if you have to you have to really take care of your equipment because if you scratch the lens or something then you have to go buy a new one basically um the uh insta is looking very interesting the modular camera the x mm. the R, sorry um looks very interesting when they have two one inch sensors on that for 360 it'll be more interesting um and of course those are just kind of prosumer cameras yeah uh when you get into big rigs i've i've never had the pleasure of using a big rig um there's awesome stuff you know obviously this is beyond um, the beyond the sort of insta pro size yeah. this is yeah so the titan would be nice oh. so yeah there's plenty of cameras out there. if you're starting out i would honestly um you need you've, it depends on your budget so if you're real early day early days under 100 pounds a little nano that goes on top of your phone which again is an Insta product awesome fun really really good fun play with it and um and the more people who are playing with them and using them and putting content out there the more of an audience you know that will create an audience yeah. Um, because they'll get used to the technology it's already really robust it's already mature there's plenty to do with it so little nano on top of your phone is a great start um pick up a second hand camera you know uh that they'll they'll be as cheap as chips but I've, I've got i just gave one away the other day I gave my rich my first theater camera i just gave it to my um to laura my wife's uh cousin oh that was very nice of me wasn't yeah, it yeah very nice um, not, not a lot to film at the moment unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> That's story. I, I don't know about that. The splint, yeah, I'd, I'd love to get out there and uh, and shoot some of the people are going out there and shooting the beautiful places. Centre of Paris, completely empty, and all yeah. this. You know, I actually thought this would be an excellent time for the Google Street View cars to go crazy. I would, if I was Google, I'd send them all out now. You really would. You it's really some would. Very special images. It's, as you said, it's a great docu piece of documentary hardware. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, just look on the internet, see your price point. Don't, um, what can I say not to do? Don't waste your money. Think about what you're going to do with the camera. If you're going to spend eight or nine hundred pounds on a camera, think about a way of making some money with it. Unless you're very wealthy. Um, if, you're, if you're just going to have some fun, just spend a hundred and odd pounds, 150, 200 pounds max um and uh and just just have some fun and i suppose that actually this is also my opportunity to do a bit of a shout out for the fuse box residency at the moment uh, our office the fuse box is closed uh, as everyone's working from home uh but our innovation hub the fuse box does have access to the brighton immersive lab so we have a range of different 360 cameras available so if this has piqued your interest but you don't want to get involved get started now once it's all over, get in touch with uh, me or someone at the fuse box, and we can we can arrange some ch chances to try out some cameras. But I think that's a nice opportunity as well. Oh, it's complete! It's the best opportunity ever. It's been a it's been wonderful for me to be able to get access to so many different pieces of hardware, to become accustomed with how they work, um, and to build my confidence with different bits of kit. Mm -hmm. And I Fusebox to thank for that because they've, they've you know you have a variety of kit there to just to play with and that's uh that's fantastic nice and then there's we we, we sort of i mean the talk this is title 360 but um there is another sort of sub sub genre sub medium which is 180 content yeah um, i i see a, a large amount of 180 content being shared particularly if it's 3d because i believe it's much more efficient with the amount of um the amount of data that's required, the size of the files, the amount you have to stream or download. Yeah. Uh, where where do you see three uh, one eighty fitting in? Is that something that you've dabbled with, or is it something that you sort of? I haven't dabbled with it. Um, obviously, uh, my friend John McClellan worked with one of the other Fusebox residents and created the lovely Alice in Wonderland mm -hmm. experience. That was in one eighty. With uh, that was a Google project, I think. Yeah, Wonderland XR. Yeah, Wonderland so I'll take a look at that. The great thing with 180 is you, its USP really is, I would say, is the 3D-ness. Um, when I first came across 180, wherever many years ago it was, two, three years ago, probably, properly, I thought, this is fantastic because I'm not interested in what's behind me. 
mm. unless it's something that's truly immersive. Most of the time, I'm only interested in what's in the 180. And um, to be able to look around that 180 was, is enough. And to be able to look around that 180 in, three, in 3D, in stereoscopic, is um, is an opportunity. Of course, inevitably, there are barriers. You know, I, I knew a, a, a research scientist at uh, Philips, and he helped to invent uh, e-paper. Yeah. And um, I talked to him about stereoscopic 3D images and video, and he said, I'm not interested in that. I said, well, why not? He said, well, I've only got one eye, and I didn't know. So th th that's an extreme case, but mm. there are plenty of people out there who have astigmatisms, who have issues with their eyesight, who, you know, 3D stereoscopic images isn't for everybody, and it is awkward. It's a, it's a, it's a fairly niche thing, but it's a, it's a good place. Mm. You've got the viewers who can enjoy it. I think that's I think that's really fun, and I, I think it's immersive. I think point cloud is the is the is the really exciting thing. Um, I don't know anything about that, but what I've seen of it, capturing things, you know, uh, point cloud and getting yeah. into a, a virtual space. That's that's the technology to watch. Because... We got to play with a few lidar scans. I think early when I first started the fusebox a couple of years ago. Yeah. Uh, and the, the lidar stuff is very exciting. I don't know. I don't know how far away we are from it being, being sort of, consumer accessible. There, yeah. there, there, there's because there is some. We we had a full lidar scan of an entire pub, and it removes that uh, three degrees of um of freedom that you have, because it is not. Yeah. It's it's a basically a three D model at that point. It's sort of a combination between the two. I'm hoping there's a there's a combination. There's a melding of two technologies to come in there mm -hmm. that hasn't yet where you'll capture some kind of as you say some scan of a three-dimensional space and then use something else to put in it use mm -hmm. some other inside it well have you seen the latest update to matterport where it now supports the 360 1x yes and um, the, uh, there's support as well there's two cameras it supports yeah yeah i, I know the 1x because that's the one i think we had on hand Rico and the rico the, the theta yeah. and, the, and the insta yeah it's those that's two isn't it? I know that uh, Steve J. Shout out Steve J. from Fusebox. He was he was trying out uh, tried it out in Matterport, doing his entire home just before Great. the lockdown, and it worked spectacularly well. And it well, actually gets all the transactions transitions between you know every yeah. part moving, so it has a relational understanding between photographs. And what everybody needs to know is it's free until you start to Ish. want to make it. Yeah, well, it is. It's, it's free one. for free for one model at a time. Yeah one model at a time yeah so what you do is you just make one model have a go and learn it and then you've got something to show for it and go for it yeah absolutely yeah. fantastic um yeah. and uh on that actually i know it's now off the 360 subject but there's also stuff going on with depth cameras which is closer to the lidar approach mm -hmm. uh so i think we've someone made an application which finally uses the depth camera on the latest huawei phone and you can walk around an entire environment and just film it with your phone and it captures the depth data from every photograph and then textures and makes a 3d model of your environment and cool. i've had that that's been a reasonable source of entertainment the past few days <laughs> trying to build yeah. a complete 3d model of an entire entire home but that's oh, yeah. the mission but uh if i had a 360 camera i'd have done it with matterport by now i imagine you know how to have fun chris oh i do <laughs> it's depressing uh so uh I, we've talked about the hardware, uh, and we've talked about Matterport. So we've talked about some software, but what do you, what is your uh, like editing workflow? What do you what do you use once you've filmed the footage? Okay, it's not necessarily the best. I use Final Cut Pro Ten because um, I it's the software that I'm used to, and it's the one that I like, and it's you know it's the devil I know. Mm -hmm. Probably the best one to use is Premiere. Um, for 360, Premiere is very, it's got a very mature product, the integration with all Insta the other as well. Tools. Yeah, or the integration with Insta, if you're using an Insta camera, certainly it's well integrated. Um, I, I overcome all the challenges I have with Final Cut, um, which would be a tedious chore for anybody who, who, didn't, who didn't want to. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like the workflow with Final Cut, although it has huge frustrations with audio. Um, especially exporting to things like Pro Tools. 
Um, but again, there are ways around that mm -hmm. using resolve, which I won't go into. It's very boring. Um, but there's a way around everything. For every technical problem, there's a creative solution. For every creative problem, there's a technical solution. Okay. Uh, and so I, I would, if you're starting out, I'd say use Premiere. Yeah, that's, I mean, I did as well. That, that, that's my, my side. I would, I think Premiere yeah. is a post-production product. Yeah. Um, I've yeah, actually so seen I'm... some really interesting things people have been doing. I think it was with the Insta, I think it's with any stereoscopic 360 camera. Oh, yeah. um, which is building up like a depth, um, building up depth data. Uh -huh. So because by having that stereoscopic view, you can actually get a 360 depth map, which means that I've seen people starting to do things where you have like text and credits that can pop behind 3D objects in the scene. Yeah. Because uh, you can now generate a depth map from the instance, which is really, really nice to see. That, yeah. that was a cool. That, that's when you want to take it into After Effects and get a bit, get, get a bit crazier. After Effects, amazing, powerful tool. And, um, I, I'm not skilled with After Effects, so if it came to it, you know, if anyone had this idea of what they wanted to do, or if I was giving someone an idea of what's possible, um, then go ahead and give some expert who in After Effects a job, because that's the way to go. You know, building up teams of people with or bringing all their expertise to these challenges is what it's all about. And, uh, sorry, we've just had a question come in from Make Real, which is... Oh, good. Yeah, no, can't can't turn down a question. Uh, no. The the question was is how do you think these three D scanning tools will impact traditional three hundred and sixty film? Uh, will they merge into one? Do you think will the director producer still be uh, relevant, or with it uh, with more user orientated control? Just before we go there, this is actually why I actually bought up one hundred and eighty as a, as a medium because mm. I think that that's a lot of the reason I see one hundred and eighty being used, particularly for sort of vlog type content or just sort of general docu like sort of self-documenting content is yep. that you still have that level of directorial control which i think 360 in some ways takes away parts of it yeah you still you, you can't say you know this person look at this person's hand right now or look at this particular piece of detail but with 180 at least you can say the action is this way <laughs> you don't have to you, you're not going to miss it at least yes I'm going to take the make real question. Yeah. And I'm going to say what uh, it will bring some extraordinary creative opportunities for people. And um and let's wait and see. I mean the, the thing to do is to is to find the job that requires a bit of experimentation and then have a go. Mm -hmm. Um certainly. So yes. Um yeah, an amazing opportunity and uh, it's easy to say that let's sit here and wait and see what other people are going to do. But um, the first thing I would say is identify the job that require that could make use of that kind of thing and have a go, and uh, and that that would be a very exciting opportunity. And I think the last sort of technology that sort of ties into those sort of three D scanning tools is also stuff like Google Light uh, Light Google Light Fields. Is yes. Light Fields? Yeah, Light Fields. Um, because that that's a very exciting tech as well, which is is it's much more three hundred and sixty actually. It's just three hundred and sixty, but six degrees of freedom. Uh, yeah, that's but, beyond what I can. <laughs> I, I I think outside of Google, there's not a lot of people that are experienced working with that. Yeah. Do you know the one thing I, I really want to draw attention to at this point mm -hmm. is that it's so easy to get carried away with what's possible in the future and forget about what we can do now with the really mature technology that we have. The platforms that we have and um, the, the the capture technology and the and the and the, produ and the production tools and the and the and the sharing platforms that we have. There's so much more we can do with those. Yes, it's exciting the idea of <clears throat> the new stuff and um, and what what's going to be in the future. And we've got to keep a weather eye on that. Mm -hmm. So what we've got to really do is exploit to the max what we can do with what's available now and what really works. Yeah. And that, that's kind of, that's the room I'm sitting in. Which is excellent. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then the, the last part of this whole like pipeline of going through your content uh, is about sharing and hosting the content. So again, this is for probably for people interested or wanting to learn. Is where do you, where do you put your content online? Do you use Vimeo? Do you use YouTube? Or do you send? Do you only deal with raw files as well? What's 
Yes, Vimeo, YouTube, one click at Final Cut Pro 10 straight up to my account. Fantastic. Facebook, awesome. Um, you can just dump stuff there quick and easy. You can play with it. You don't need a VR headset to enjoy it. You can just put 360 content on those, certainly on those three platforms. Google Photos. Um, so, yeah, Google with uh, YouTube and uh, Facebook. Um, all, all good stuff. Okay. Yeah. I think I, I think we we touched on the live the live streaming side of of three hundred and sixty a little bit. I think that as yeah as the five G starts to roll out properly, um, and we start seeing a more reliable, consistent internet, hopefully, uh, or coverage, then we will see some really interesting things there. Sure. Can I just back up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Going back to the platforms, I mean, with um, headsets, it's very easy to download uh, footage from. A Vimeo in particular onto a headset and view them there. And of course, there's loads of things in you know, libraries, headset libraries, um, Steam, Oculus Library, wherever you go to find. There's so much stuff out there. I mean, I'd, I'd really enjoy, um, I don't do a lot of it, but I do enjoy, I'm a bit sad actually. I look at corporate 360 films. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't go for the, the um, entertainment ones. Although I did watch some very dark kind of dracula type uh, horror 360 things, which were genuinely quite scary. Mm -hmm. I don't do a lot of that. But there's some very good corporate ones out there, um, all in 360. It's all on the internet, man. Yeah. I don't need to tell you that. It's all out there. If you want to find it, it's there. If you go, if you don't, if you go looking for it and you don't find it, make it and put it there and someone else will find it. Well, so I... I was going to ask my sort of last wrapping up question was sort of asking what, what would you, is there, is there anything out there you'd recommend people to go and have a look at in particular? Um, I mean, I have, I have one suggestion, which is my, is the one that I seem to show absolutely everybody that ever comes into the fuse box, mm. uh, which is the short film Mayubi. Yeah. Which you introduced me to, I should no add. One that yet. No one stopped that yet. Yeah. Mayubi is so fantastic. Um uh, it puts a really good it puts a really good uh, explanation and plot device as to why you're in the movie to begin with. I don't want to spoil too much, uh, mm. but there is an Easter egg in there, and nobody knows about the Easter egg, which is that if you because the cool thing with 360 is you can make it interactive. Uh, the, the, because this isn't a video file that you download. This is actually an application technically, which means it has some built-in interaction, so they can track where you're looking, what you're what you're reacting to. And there's a bit where if you can spot the three parts of their logo in the video and you stare at them for a second each, you get a private one-on-one -on -one scene with Jeff Goldblum at the end. Oh, I, I thought it was just watching the whole thing through. I, Did... you have to, if you look at things, you'll see it activates, if you get it on the Oculus App Store anyway. Oh, okay. Um, it was really I, cool I... to see interaction tied in as well, which is something which yeah. not a lot of people are doing. The opportunities are awesome, awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, so what I would recommend is wherever you are in the real world, when you're not looking at your computer, when you haven't got your headset on, do you close your eyes and use your imagination and uh, go wherever you want to first? And then if it's cool in your own head, see if you can create it in 360 for a headset. But don't don't be inspired so much by things you see in the headset or things you see in 360. Be inspired by the world around you and the people around you and try and capture that for other people. There we go. I think that, that I think that I was I was about to say, like, what would you recommend as your final tips for anyone looking into it? I think uh, you just did that. So close your eyes and go there without the headset on. Yeah. Well, I think unless you have anything else you would like to add, I, I think the best thing one thing is how do people find out more about you? And what you do and your work and your experience i'm not hiding from anybody i'm on the internet i'm all i'm there somewhere on the internet my email address is please ask me i was really wanting more questions from people thank you make real for asking a question yeah um, so if anyone's got any questions for me yeah get in touch and i will answer them and enjoy talking to you whoever you are <laughs> So, yeah, and actually also if you are watching this after the event, uh, you'll probably be aware this video is going up as a YouTube video on our channel as well. So if, you, yeah. if you're watching this live and you want to share this with someone who you know was interested in 360 and wanted to learn a bit or just hear someone chat about it, yeah. do share that around. Um, I mean, WI. 
Sorry? My mother's WI group. There we go. Yeah. Um, the, yeah. Pass it. Uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. Nice professional end. So thank you very much for joining me, Michael. Um, it's been a real pleasure to chat to you. Uh, if you hang on the line, I'll come and have a chat again afterwards. Okay. You've got a figure there as well. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank, thank you everyone for watching and thanks for joining us. Bye.